started in about five minutes, but it looks like everyone's ready, so we might as well get started right now. I'm Rebecca McEnroy with KUT, and I'd like to thank everyone, everybody for coming this evening. It's a very special evening, a night to honor not only a man whose work has impacted most of our lives, for most of our lives, but also to thank and give our gratitude to the people who are helping us all experience his art in new ways every day. And that is his band and his biographer, Sylvie Simmons, who we'll be speaking with this evening. Um, so before we get started, please no flash photography, for reminding me back there. Um, and also no cell phones. So if you could just please silence your cell phones. We will be streaming this evening live at KUT.org. So if you wanted to, if you could text somebody right now before we get started and just let them know. <laughs> um, thank you very much to Efren Salinas and to Amy Chambliss for videotaping this evening. Also, yes, thank you very much. Also to our wonderful sound engineers, we have Casey Cheek hidden in the back and he's mixing for the video. So thank you, Casey, and Jeff Hoskins mixing for the room. Thank you very much. Our bartenders tonight, I'd like to thank Chris Luak and James Morgan and Garrett Fulce behind the bar. Thank you very much. And from KUT and the Cactus Cafe, Matt Munoz and Hawk Mendenhall, thank you very much for making this evening possible. And of course, I have to give a special thanks, even before I introduce him, to a man who, without his uh, generosity of spirit and his kindness, none of this would ever have happened. A very good friend to the Cactus Cafe, a staple musician here in Austin, and someone who's traveled and been a friend of Leonard Cohen's for a very long time, Roscoe Beck. Thank you very much. <laughs> so with no, no further ado, I don't think I have any other announcements, although I'm so excited I'll probably forget something. Um, this woman has uh, spent a large portion of her life chronicling the lives of musicians all around the world. She has a biography of Serge Gainsbourg that has reached critical acclaim. And right now on the New York Times bestseller list, most of you have already read it, I'm Your Man, the biography of Leonard Cohen. Ladies and gentlemen, Sylvie Simmons. English. I have a cup of tea with me at all times. Ah, is this the is the sound right check. Now? Is that good enough? Can good. you hear me now? I can't see anybody in the back, so I can't ask you to wave your hands if you can't, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sylvie, I, I'd like to start off by uh, just getting a little bit of the background, your background. How did you first come to know of Leonard Cohen? How were you first introduced to him? And then you told me the other day that you felt like you were now ready to write this book about three years ago. What made you ready to write this book? Well, the first part of it is that I was a young teenage girl in London. In 1968, they released in England a compilation album called The Rock Machine Turns You On, and it had a Leonard Cohen track on there. So it's the first time I heard him sing. It was the song Sisters of Mercy. And it was the day I hit puberty. They didn't have DNA back then to prove it, but it was the day I hit puberty. And I don't know if that had any significance, but something about his voice just moved me. And I remember seeing a picture of his album cover when I saved up my pocket money and bought it and was totally horrified because he looked like he was my granddad or something. <laughs> you know, he didn't look like a beetle. But, uh, you know, I fell in love with the music and um, over the years, you know, I became a music journalist, a rock journalist in 1977, and I started getting my albums for free, but always looked forward to his. And I'd interviewed him a couple of times. Once in 2001, we did an interview that lasted three days. No nights before anybody asked that in the <laughs> questions. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he, uh, you know, he was giving me what I thought was a fantastic interview, and like every journalist that leaves his presence, you know, you feel somehow 
transported and transfigured and that you've got the best interview of all time and then you look at it and it's like there's so much smoke and mirrors in there. So I thought, you know, okay, I've read some books on him, but I'd like to try one. That was a long time ago, and, and so I kind of put it off quite a while. And in the end, I just thought, no, I've got to knuckle down, and that's what I was doing for the last three years. So you mentioned something, which is uh, smoke and mirrors. Mm. And I wanted to ask you just briefly to um, touch upon his childhood in Montreal in the 30s and 40s, but then also talk about one thing in your book that's very significant, which is his introduction to hypnosis. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I'd rather start with that. But, but to just tell a bit about his past, it was very interesting. I kind of thought of Leonard in a way as I was writing this book as an outsider artist. And I know that that has a different connotation now. It kind of means somebody who kind of sits around and <laughs> looks kind of a bit lost and forlorn and has their mum look after them. But with Leonard, that definitely, <laughs> well, maybe it was the case, but it wasn't the way I was thinking of him. And he... Um, he always seemed to be a bit outsider, you know, sort of stayed outside of every kind of, of movement. But he was always slightly in it. His toe was dipped in it. And I think it kind of stemmed back to his childhood. He was born in Montreal into a very prominent Jewish family in an area called Westmount, which was largely a Protestant Anglo-Canadian community. So he was kind of like in a kind of minority there. But this community was a minority within the French province, you know, which was a minority within the English-speaking country of Canada. So everybody kind of felt that they were somehow blessed and different. And But being Canadians and so nice, they all kind of seemed to get along with each other pretty well until the, <laughs> until the, you know, the quiet revolution. Even that was a quiet revolution, for heaven's sake. And so Leonard absorbed, you know, the, the synagogue and, and the music of the synagogue and the writings of his Jewish faith but also went to a school where he celebrated all the regular Christian kind of things. And so everything was this big mi mishmash that had such an impact on him. The biggest impact was when his father died, when Leonard was nine years old. And even though he says that you know, he didn't cry and you know, he doesn't remember it being a huge scar, nine years old it would have been. It also meant that he had his mom and his sister, the only other people in the family, so he was in a house of women to dote on him and allow him a lot more, probably, freedom to do what he wanted to do. So that's pretty much his childhood. He also was very much like, a, I guess, any little boy, into magic tricks and being a magician, so smoke and mirrors, definitely. But one thing I thought was wonderful is that uh, when I was going through his archives, he allowed me access to, I found a little book of hypnotism, 25 Lessons in Hypnotism. And uh, it had Leonard's handwriting all neat, like a little kid has at the bottom. And in his early teens, he did actually teach himself to hypnotize. And he got through the first lesson of how to hypnotize your dog and cat. <laughs> and, you know, having had success with the domestic animals, he moved on to the domestic staff and uh, hypnotized the family maid. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> it's just too Leonard Cohen. You can't make these things up. You imagine, this is young Leonard, you know, he used to put Kleenex, if it was called Kleenex back then in those days, but whatever the equivalent was, he stuffed into his shoes to make himself a little taller, so it's little Leonard. There's the family maid, one assumes was slightly bigger, you know, so she could dust the top shelves. And uh, he kind of sat her down and made her look in his eyes, and he spoke to her softly and gently, and uh, told her to relax. And then he told her to undress. And she did. Now, uh, my theory is that she was putting him on, you know. But nonetheless, <laughs> here he was with his first sight of a naked woman. And I think that, you know, he's said before that, you know, the sight of the naked woman was something that was so special and so important. And it's never left him. He was coming out with his usual wonderful grand language, like that's Eve standing over you, the morning and the dew. And really, so that was his hypnotism thing. And there was a lesson. There was Sorry, I don't want to... Uh, you know, go on too long, but this is amazing. There was this chapter in the book that was how to hypnotize a room full of people, and it sounded exactly like uh, how to be Leonard Cohen primer. If I should ever write one, which I won't, that would be the chapter. Like, speak slowly, deeply, do not hurry. <laughs> and it worked. relationship with women um, mm -hmm. a little later on, but I'd, I also 
also wanted to, to mention something that you touched upon with this, is this idea of being an outsider. You know, um, Roscoe came up with the title of, of the event this evening, Leonard Cohen, A Life in Art. And I think the significance of that can't be overstated because what he has done has been to maintain himself and his artistic vision through years and decades of change, social change and political change. And um, what, what I found really fascinating was a friend of his, uh, the poet Irving Layton, said, Leonard Cohen is interested in maintaining the self, maintaining the self when at every angle the self is being steamrolled out of existence. And so I think it's really a, s a significant um, point that you make, that he was on the outside, but not only is he on the outside, he's helping us all to maintain who we are, you know, being on the outside of whatever we may find ourselves. Well, really, his life was in art, and it was art. <coughs> Everything was really done and directed towards the art. When I was talking to friends of his from childhood in Montreal at the beginning of the research, they would all say that even as a little kid, he had the notebook in his pocket, and he would sit wrapped writing stuff, and then promptly lose the notebook somewhere, but then fill up another one. So that was always going there, and of course, there's great famous stories about Leonard, and you know, he did love women, you know, horizontally, vertically, and everywhere in between. But, but really, you know, even that, that's all directed into the art, you know, the art was really the most important thing, and very, very serious to him. And right before we get to the first performance of the evening, I would like to talk, or I would like you to talk about someone who sustained him, and this is when he found the work of Francisco uh, Lorca. Federico Garcia Lorca. Uh, um. Yes, that was an amazing story. Um, he was 15 years old. I, I consider this like the Big Bang of Leonard, if you like. He'd, he'd gone outside of a secondhand bookshop and he just was leafing through the selected poems of Lorca. And he read a poem from it. And he said that the hair stood up on the back of his neck. And what was interesting, it was almost like a kind of synesthesia. He had said that as soon as he read these words, they made him think of like the power of the music of the synagogue. So he kind of visually felt it musically. And he had said that in his life, there's no difference between music and word. And that does seem to be very much the truth. And that same year, he got his first guitar. So I think that, you know, that's when it really fused in him, even though he concentrated initially on being a poet and a novelist and only really turned to music because you can't make any money as a poet and a novelist in Canada. And because, you know, eventually even can Canada's very generous grant system will run out at some point. He took a move into writing songs. He was going to be a writer, not a singer, a songwriter. But you're absolutely right that Lorca had a great influence. And Lorca also had a lot of poems that he titled songs and ballads and was a collector of music and, you know, loved flamenco, loved music. So I think that Leonard felt that this was a sort of almost a fellow traveler, even though, you know, Lorca was long dead. Well, that leads us to music. So great. I'm going to, we're going to step down for just a Absolutely. little bit and then we'll be back good up. Good stuff. But I would like to have uh, Roscoe come on stage and introduce the amazing musicians which we have with us this evening. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Roscoe Beck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, practically the whole band, the whole touring band is here tonight and uh, you'll get to meet them one by one. Uh, but we're gonna start off, uh, oddly enough, ironically with an, <laughs> an instrumental version of, of a Leonard Cohen song, since uh, it's all about the lyrics. But anyway, <laughs> I'd like to bring up uh, some of the musicians. Uh, Javier Mas from Barcelona. Alex Bublici from Moldova. And from right here in Austin, Texas, Mitch Watkins on guitar. So 
we're just going to warm up uh, playing an instrument, uh, instrumental version of a song of Leonard's called Nancy.
Much is said about uh, Leonard's lyrics, but he does write some beautiful melodies. Uh, so right now, I'd like to introduce you to the Webb sisters, Hattie and Charlie Webb. I think a lot of us already know each other from other concerts, which is good because we're, we're all friends in here. We're going to sing a song called Show Me The Place. Show mm -hmm. 
just a tad more and open it open up some questions to the band as well and then they'll do one more song and then we'll open up questions to everyone so get your questions ready and I'll be coming around with a mic Maybe I, like to get a show. I think that's a good oh, idea yeah, yeah please sure. absolutely <laughs> all right the next musical number uh, when we do it will feature <laughs> <Yes. laughs> will feature my my dear friend Sharon Robinson his visit to Cuba. Can you talk a little bit about what drove him there? He was said to have fought for both sides during the revolution. <laughs> so maybe talk about that. Well, again. you know, that's kind of a hard one to make really a short answer to. But that again seems to stem back to his childhood. Leonard told me something that surprised me. He said that he'd planned to go to military academy as a school. He'd wanted to go. And I think it was through admiration for his father his father had been one of the first Jewish officers to serve in World War I for Canada. And uh, his father had had a gun that he kept in a drawer, sort of a memento from the war. And I think it was just a kind of bonding thing with his dad initially that he was drawn to that. Plus little boys like guns, you know. And uh, then it seemed to go on. His mother obviously didn't want him to go to military academy, you know. Once uh, her husband had died, she thought it was a very bad idea. She'd already lost one man and slightly as a result of war uh, injuries or something that we could never quite work out what it was. But Leonard was always very interested in war, as he called it, stupid male treats, as he put it to me. But he was also very interested in utopias and the idea of there being an ideal existence. And his friend from childhood, Mort Rosengarten, said they talked about that a lot as kids, that you know, when the Second World War is over, it's all going to change, but it didn't really kind of work out to their plan. So I think he, that was one of the reasons why he went to Cuba, was that the socialist revolution had just taken place. And Leonard, very much out of character, was kind of wearing combat pants and a beret and a sort of Che Guevara beard and, and went out there. And... He wrote some, some good stuff out there, you know. He was keeping something called the famous Havana Diary, which I found in his archives, and was quite interesting. But he often had this interest in war, and, and later on he actually tried to um, enlist in the Israeli army and uh, during the Yom Kippur War, I think it was. And he, um, I know he said that women only let you leave home for the war, so he went there. They didn't accept him. He performed for the troops. And I think that over time, you know, he has different opinions. He often, as you said, takes both sides of things. You know, he's a very considered deep man, so you can't really pin him down as a raging socialist or, you know, warmonger. He just goes with his convictions. Mm -hmm. And both sides of things also leads us to the next subject, mm -hmm. which is um, how he, his relationship with women Oh. Which sides are we talking about? Yeah. <laughs> this could be dangerous. <laughs> okay. Well, I think what was really fascinating about your book uh, is is the non-judgmental stance that you take. You know, there's this a very um, kind of beautiful balance between genders in his book, and also I was talking with Sharon a little earlier about the balance between gender and the voices and, and the sound and. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, his relationship with women in his life and what that's meant to his work? 
Well, as I was saying earlier, you know, he was raised in a house of women. It was his sister and his mom. And I think he tended to very much kind of accept, rely on, and love the support of women. There were a lot of women in his life who weren't his lovers, or if they were his lovers, that wasn't the chief reason why they were important in his life. You have to remember that he's his long-term engineer, Leanne Unger, woman, long-time songwriting partner sitting behind me, Sharon Robinson. His first manager was uh, a woman, is a woman. She's still alive, and she hasn't changed gender that I know of. <laughs> But, you know, I'm in San Francisco these days, so nothing would surprise me. And the first champion he had was Judy Collins, who covered Suzanne and, and pretty much acted as a cheerleader to him. And she said, I didn't even ask her, you know, it wasn't my business, but she said, I wasn't Leonard's lover. God, it was hard enough <laughs> without that. And so, uh, you know, women have been important in many ways, and there have certainly been very many muses and uh, people who've you know, really been there inspired many, many songs. And, and I thought that it was important to talk to these women, not because I wanted to find out what was happening behind the bedroom door, but you know, if somebody lives with somebody and wakes up with them most mornings, they're going to know if that person is a tortured poet or whether it's all a put on. You know? Actually, one woman I was really fascinated to talk to was Rebecca de Mornay, the actress. And, uh, I kind of just asked her the obvious question as I thought he was engaged to you and then he became a monk. <laughs> you know, went lived in a monastery. This is you know, this doesn't make sense. And she sort of said, like, you know, it hasn't done her reputation any good after you. <laughs> they go to a monastery for five years. So, you know, women certainly have played a role, but I think that, you know, when I was going through some pictures of, of Leonard's from his childhood, every time he stopped at a picture of a woman, there was something that changed in his face, you know. That I think that the love was always there. He just, I guess, needed to be alone to do his work. I'd like to ask uh, the band some questions now. Um, so you're in the middle of a worldwide tour. And this, maybe Roscoe, you could speak just a little bit about what it's been like so far and where everyone is kind of at right now coming to the States. Um, well, we are in the middle of a tour, uh, despite the fact that a couple of us live here. Um, it's really a continuation of the tour that started in 2008. Uh, we toured in 2008, 2009. We played the U.S. 2010 continued around the world and then there was about a year and a half break uh, while Leonard made the uh, old ideas record and we started up again in August in Belgium and we just we just came off of uh, two months in Europe and uh, now we do the US and Canada through Christmas so we're keeping busy um, the reaction has just been Incredible, and I think you know certainly Mitch and Sharon could could speak to this too because uh, Mitch and Sharon and I have all been on board with Leonard on and off for 33 years since 1979. So uh, it, it was a very different scene uh, touring with Leonard in 1979 uh, <laughs> than it than it is now. I think uh, all of us could could speak to that, um, but. Uh, just want to say that things are going fantastic, actually. Um, the audiences uh, around the world that we've played to have just been wonderful. And uh, people are opening up to Leonard and his writings and his music and his other artwork uh, like never before. It's, uh, it's really something to, to witness and be a part of. And speaking to that, um, it must be very powerful to you know, witness people who have been going to his shows, maybe 40 or 50 shows now, you know, together. And uh, they cry in the audience, and his music is affecting them very deeply. And you're a part of this, and you see it, but you're also playing every day and on the road. Could, maybe, could you talk a little bit about what it's like negotiating this exalted existence with the everyday, maybe? <laughs> Anybody else want to talk about that? No. <laughs> Anybody can speak to it. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, good. Sure. Well, um, I found that uh, when 
when we're in the midst of a concert, the the sort of everydayness of it quite dissipates and disappears. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I found that you know immersing myself in in Leonard's work and lyrics and melodies just really really takes you out of the everyday the same as it does for the audience. And I, I, I try to relate to the audience from the, sort of the same place that, that they're relating to the music from. And I've found that night after night, I find new things in the words to, uh, to think about and to make associations that I had never made before and all that. So I don't, I don't think it's hard to do. That's very powerful, actually. Uh, Roscoe, you told me something um, when you were on the um, this last tour that you had an experience which was just a little bit out of body. Did you want to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> Not out of body exactly, but there there was a uh, there was one afternoon that uh, I arrived at Soundcheck, and and I just I I got this very strange feeling as as I was as I was approaching the stage because everyone else was already on there. And uh, suddenly I, I had the, the feeling of newness that particular day. Of, it was like I had never done it before. And Leonard was already up there playing and a couple of other guys were already up there playing and, and it just sounded beautiful to me. And I was, I was walking towards the bandstand and I was thinking, I'm gonna go up there and play with these guys. And and it just it just all seemed very new that particular day. I just I saw it with new eyes, and it was like, how cool is this? <laughs> <laughs> have, have anybody else have anybody else had similar stories like that? You know how you approach the the relationship, the music. I was just going to say we often actually say to each other backstage, should we? Do you fancy doing a concert? This. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's somewhere we can play. A couple of people might come. <laughs> and Leonard says, I'll sing. <laughs> um, you know, I often find when I speak to musicians who are out on the road with someone for a long period of time that they need to maintain their chops, you know, their own artistic visions and their own um, projects and what they're doing. How do you maintain yourself when this music is so intensely about you know, the self and the person and your own path? How do you do that when you're also part of such a powerful um, presentation? Or how do you negotiate that, maybe? Well, you do spend a lot of time in hotel rooms. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's time to work on what you might uh, be w doing creatively. But what I find from working uh, with Leonard is that this, my stuff gets better from having just been exposed to his uh, vision. So, but there's, t there's time. I mean, you know, we, three or four hours a day, we're, we've got nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to say that when we finish the show, it's depending on where we are, it's midnight or 1 a.m. and then we all go back to our hotel rooms and, and I think at that point there's a place where you've shared this amazing moment with people because I feel like we're all part of this together and then you have this moment of quiet where you're in your own four walls and that is still resonating within you and that to me is a really beautiful moment where you're still in that energy of the concert and and uh, that's a good place to just be with yourself or be with your creative thoughts and um, that's beautiful. Well I know we're all dying to hear Sharon so I think uh, would you talk a little bit about the piece that you're going to perform before you before you sing? Sure. Uh, I'm going to sing uh, Alexandra Leaving which is, which is a song that I wrote with Leonard uh, for the album Ten New Songs. And um, it's a translation of a poem by Constantine Kabathi, uh, which is a, uh, a 
beautiful set of ideas about where the mind goes in, in the face of loss. And um, I think Leonard's translation is abs absolutely beautiful. And I was you know, honored to be given those lyrics to, to write the music to. So, uh, the stage is yours.
Yes, we have one last band member you haven't met yet. <laughs> our drummer, we have no uh, room for drums up here, but our drummer, Rafael Gaiol, come join us on stage. And so I would like to open it up to questions. If you just raise your hand, make sure that uh, you're on mic. We have one right up here in front, Mr. Jody Denver. Thanks. I had a question for Sylvie. Um, Sylvie, I was curious about Leonard's relationship with his children, uh, what you learned about that relationship, and also curious what you think Leonard might make of a night like tonight. <laughs> well, musically, he would love it. The fact that there's beautiful women here means he would love it. And the fact that there are people who are listening so quietly and attentively, he would love that too, because you know, the respect he has for other people's art and other people's work as well as his own. As for his relationship with his children, <coughs> they're extremely close. I think that uh, those who know anything about Leonard know that the, uh, you know, his two children by the same woman, Suzanne Elwood, were brought up for part of the time away from him. But he pretty much kind of slipped behind the curtains in his career at that point so that he could go over to France on a regular basis where Suzanne had taken the children and see them as much as he could. So it's um, a very close relationship. Anyone? Let's see. Just raise your hand. Hi there. Yes. One moment. I'm coming over. Oh. Well, thank you all. Really terrific. And uh, it's a nice week in Texas because some of us will see Leonard tomorrow night and Bob Dylan on November 1st. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Leonard gets a little shout out from Bob in ISIS, right? That's he says right. something like this is a song 
for you if you're still here, Leonard, a song about marriage. Yeah. I wondered if you would, any of you want to riff on the relationship, if any, or the influence of, of Dylan on Leonard and Leonard on Dylan. Is there anybody else here if I got to do all the talking? <laughs> Okay, I hope I, am I blocking the, the ladies behind me because they're so much more ornamental and I don't want to do that. Um, it's a very interesting, you know, I could never find any evidence for uh, Leonard having met Dylan when he was living in New York in the 60s, but they did meet at a concert very early on on his first tour and, and they had a strange meeting backstage that was described to me by two different people and I tended to not believe anything was even vaguely true unless it was verified by two different people telling it to me and then I still tried to check for more. And as it was described to me initially by Ron Cornelius, who was Leonard's guitar player from uh, Songs of a Room and Songs of Love of Hate and the live album after that, he'd also been the, uh, Bob Dylan's guitar player. And as it was told to me initially that Bob Dylan had come backstage, apparently Bob Dylan was very grumpy and why he was grumpy was that he had uh, found the one security guard at a folk festival who didn't recognize him. <laughs> and so he said, I'm Bob Dylan, and I want, I've come to see uh, Leonard Cohen and Bob Johnston, Bob Johnston being the producer of both of those people, and an absolutely wonderful maverick who's still alive at 80 and tilting at windmills all the time and being crazy. But so uh, Bob Johnston said, never heard of him, never seen him before, and that's what I said. But he said, I'll let him in anyway. And Bob Dylan said, that wasn't funny, man. But that was my best Bob Dylan impersonation. It's not good. And um, so he went back and how Ron described it, he said, they kind of circled each other a little bit like cats. And didn't say anything. And he said that uh, Dylan broke the silence. Ha <laughs> ha, a victory for Leonard. And he said, like, um, how are you doing here, man? And Leonard said, well, you've got to be somewhere. So he was, talk <laughs> he was talking fluent Bob Dylan, even at that time. And Ron just said it was kind of really weird. It was sort of slightly kind of cagey and a little edgy. But somehow he said at the end of it, you had to kind of read the conversation between the lines. But he said at the end of it, they kind of left with a kind of real mutual re respect, which did actually blossom into a friendship. And they, you know, they saw each other intermittently over the years. It wasn't like they hung out a lot. But I think one of my favorite Bob Dylan, Lana Cohen stories was that uh, Leonard was in Paris, I believe. He was probably visiting his, his then partner who was living there. And uh, Bo Bob Dylan was there playing. And so they met in a cafe. I wish I'd been at the next table. But hey, you know, life doesn't always deal with you those. And um, Bob Dylan had said to him, hey, man, you know, I like that song of yours, Hallelujah. Your songs are coming, becoming a lot like prayers. How long did it take you to write that? And Leonard said, I told him two years. I was too ashamed to say it was five, six, maybe even seven years. And so Dylan said, yeah, yeah. And Leonard said, I like this new song of yours. How long did it take? And Bob Dylan said, 15 minutes in the back of the cab. <laughs> so two great men with two very different methods. But yes, they both had some disintegrating partnerships, which was when that ISIS uh, statement was made on the Rolling Thunder tour. <laughs> I'm curious, actually, uh, Raphael, since we have you on stage, we were talking a little bit before about um, the way that the, the music is, impacts you, you know, on uh, a daily basis while you're on stage. Maybe you could speak to that question about the touring process, working with him. I'm always um, very nervous before every show. It's, it's, it's close to what Roscoe was mentioning. Uh, and in fact, just this week with rehearsals, um, I'm feeling something new. And um, I'm kind of scared to go to the show tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I've done, I don't know how many times I've played these songs, <laughs> but I have no idea what it's going to be like tomorrow. I know, I mean, I know I've, I know it's going to be, it's going to be quite, quite the thing, um, <laughs> whatever that thing is. 
Um, and um, I'm, I'm very worked up as, as, it, as it's beginning. And um, at the end, uh, that, that's when I'm really worked up. You just <laughs> I mean, I know how long you know the shows are, and, and I'm sure a lot of you know as well. But uh, I, I, I have never, by by any means, uh, have gone you know back to the hotel room and just passed out. Just, it's just like, wow, what was that? You know, it's um, so that's that's one version. So I've heard though that <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that you're you're not alone in your nervousness before. Mm -hmm before a performance. And Sylvia and I were talking and she said that um, Leonard gets very nervous before each performance still. Have you spoken with him about this and how do you kind of manage it? Um, he likes to, uh, when I say, when I sit, when I have, I've only asked him a few times and when I have his, his response most of the time has been, they'll never get us. <laughs> <laughs> What did he say once, Roscoe, when you were talking about um, depression and you were kind of having the blues? He also gave you some really good advice. Yes, this was a little anecdote from 1979, actually, and, and Mitch, was, Mitch was present. Uh, I believe we were in airport in Paris and we were, we were about to fly somewhere. And I was just down that day, I don't know. I was just feeling down and uh, Leonard picked up on it What's, what's wrong, Rossi? And I was like, I don't know. I, I'm just depressed, I guess. And he just went, sell it. <laughs> I haven't been able to do that. <laughs> Still trying. One other question right over here. This is for the Sublime Web Sisters. Um, can you tell us how you met Leonard? <coughs> we can. We actually, we met Leonard through Sharon. Um, in 2007, Hattie and I were in Los Angeles writing for a project that we were doing and we were connected with Sharon and, and uh, a lady that we were working with in the music industry said, I think you'd work really well together and write some good music. So the three of us wrote some songs together and in the process ended up singing in three-part harmony a lot. And then in 2008, we were in LA again to record a new record of ours. Oh, and, um, and I was gonna say that the, the songwriting process that we had with Sharon was some of the best songwriting experiences we'd had all our lives. So we felt something really magical with Sharon and we just... We should try it again sometime. We should try it again sometime. <laughs> um, and, um, and just loved, the, loved singing together. And um, so we were back in LA in 2008 and, and Sharon called us and said, um, you know, would you be interested in coming down to the rehearsal and um, meeting the band and maybe doing a bit of singing and um, so we did and we met Roscoe there. We met Roscoe. Um, at the time I think Javi was there, Raphael, Roscoe, Neil, Dino and at the time another female violin player and um, Bob Metzger and um, we sang some songs. Um, a couple of things, the three of us, but at the time, actually, Sharon had a sore throat. So we were sort of trying to connect from across the room. Sharon was mouthing. <laughs> <laughs> and then Roscoe said, why don't you come back tomorrow? And the next day, Leonard was there too. That was it. I think that's a really nice, um, nice question. How did you meet Leonard Cohen? Could each of you maybe talk a little bit about your, your first meeting of Leonard Cohen and what that meant to you? Roscoe, I know your story. Yes, is good. <laughs> it's in the book. 
<laughs> I like this man. I can't wait to hear the other stories. Uh, uh, Mitch and Sharon and I all met later the same year. Um, Mitch and I uh, had a band here in Austin in the 70s called Passenger. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> so uh, Passenger uh, wrote their own material and uh, recorded. We actually never released a record, but we did a lot of recording, a lot of multi-track recording of our own material. And uh, through uh, good fortune, a cassette tape uh, ended up in the hands of a man named Henry Louie, who, uh, who was Joni Mitchell's longtime producer, record producer from her first album. Um, geez, I don't, I don't forget the last album, but seven or eight of the, of the best of Joni Mitchell records all the, all the way through uh, Shadows and Light was Henry Louie. Anyway, um, a cassette of Passenger uh, ended up in the hands of Henry Louie, and, and here I was in Austin, Texas one day in my little apartment, and the phone rang in this uh, German-American voice on the other end said, uh, Roscoe, uh, um, I have a tape of yours. It's very nice, and uh, would you be interested in in playing with Joni Mitchell. And uh, <laughs> I was kind of like, my two shirts are packed. <laughs> and, and so a Passenger had a gig that night, I do recall, and, and uh, I went to the gig and said, guys, you're not gonna believe the, the call I got today. And, uh, and, and Henry just simply said, look, he said, I can't guarantee you guys anything, but I think you'd be great with Joni. He wanted to hire the whole band, Passenger, to be Joni Mitchell's backup band. And uh, of course, we were all into that, so we packed up our cars and uh, drove out to Los Angeles just on, just on the hope of something happening. Henry said, can't make you any guarantees, but come out and I'll introduce you to Joni and we'll just see what happens. So uh, to make that long story a, a little shorter, uh, we went out there hoping to land a gig with Joni Mitchell. And uh, while we were uh, in the Hallmark Hotel just uh, burning up our credit cards waiting for something to happen, Henry called one morning and, and said, I, I need a bass player for a session uh, with Leonard Cohen. And uh, I was the bass player. And so, and so I went and uh, went over to Wally Hyder recording in Los Angeles and uh, walked in and it was just uh, Henry Louie, the producer, and Leonard and myself. And I did bring along a couple of the band members for good measure. Um, but uh, he started showing me a song called The Smoky Life that he'd been working on. And we sat down and, and played it one on one. And, uh, and we played two songs that afternoon and, and the session went very well, so uh, Leonard turned, turned to me at the end of it and he said, that was great, we should do it again. And Henry said, uh, well, he has a whole band, you know. <laughs> and Leonard said, great, next, ti next time bring them all. And uh, so that's just what happened. Uh, the very, uh, Henry booked another session and then uh, all of Passenger came and finished the recent songs record. And uh, then uh, when we finished the record uh, a month or so later, uh, uh, Leonard took us to uh, have some margaritas at a place on Sunset Boulevard called El Compadre. And over margaritas, he asked us if we wanted to do a European tour in 1979, and that's just what we did. <laughs> I, I think Mitch will go next since he was a uh, party to all that. It's, it's the same story, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything he says is true. <laughs> I believe uh, all I remember was Garth Hudson with a huge cl cloud of pot smoke around him. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't remember the song that I actually worked on when, we, when I first showed up. It was Humbled in Love. Humbled in love that's right. Yeah. Humbled in Love. But it was, uh, 
it was the interesting turn of events that, that led us to his uh, employ. Did you, did you ever get to work on that Joni Mitchell project? <laughs> no. <laughs> but this, no. This was actually the time that she then hired Jocko Pastorius and Michael Brecker and Pat Metheny and Don Elias to do her Shadows and Light uh, tour. So we were sort of in the running for that. She got the A-team. Oh. Mm. Perhaps disagree. Things worked out well, though. <laughs> Raphael, what about Chris you? We're still here. Mm -hmm. oh, which one are you? Are you going to hand it to Raphael? Or are you going to hand it to? Who's next? Who's next? Sequentially, I'll go Sharon. next, because um, I started working with Leonard shortly after the story that Roscoe just told. Um, I guess you guys have been rehearsing for a while, for a little while, for the 79 tour um, at SIR, and, and Jennifer Warrens had been uh, signed on as one of the backup singers, and um, she was sort of tasked, I think, with finding someone to go out and with her and sing with her, and my name was given to her by... I, I had been doing recording sessions and various kinds of singing work in Los Angeles and there's a network of singers who refer each other and so on. Um, so my name was given to her by one of them and uh, she called me up and I, I think I went over to her house and we sang together a little bit and we learned a couple of songs. She showed me a few of the parts and so on and, and then we came in and and uh, sang with, with the whole band at SIR, and uh, I, I guess I got the gig. <laughs> <laughs> she got it immediately. <laughs> Who's next? My story is very long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, My story is very long, and I barely speak English, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I was uh, playing with uh, his son, Mario, and we made the demo. So uh, Javier heard this demo in his house, and uh, he contacted me, and uh, he asked me if I want to do uh, two projects with Leonard's music, so I accepted. Uh, we did the project, we did... Uh, Functions and records. Yes, records, uh, CDs and DVDs, and I think Leonard saw me on DVDs, so... <laughs> what, what, what happened is that, uh, like Alex says, we make a tribute album in Spain with uh, very good singers, and we play Leonard songs in Spanish. And, uh, and I think Leonard hear it, he like it. So I think he called me in 2007, he said, if I come back to play live, you would like to come with me? And I said, yes, you know. I, I hear his voice on the phone like, Bleh. and I was, <laughs> it was uh, and it was about one o'clock in the morning, I was going to bed, and I hear, you know, and, and I was, I said, yes, yes. And he don't call me anymore for one year. <laughs> so next morning, I don't say to my friends anything because I say, you know, maybe it's going to be happen, maybe not. I only say to my son and, you know, close family, but he don't call me. And after one year, when you are rehearsals in SIR, he called me and says, uh, we, we're gonna make a tour, you call me? And I said, yes, I'm. so I have some problems with the papers because I'm Spanish and, uh, and I have to get the, the, the visa work. So I spent like a month doing this and then I come to LA and there were Roscoe, there were people playing and they, you know, start playing the songs. But the good thing is that I know the songs because I played them <laughs> before. So I was, I, was, I was worried because I'd never been playing with American musicians and all this. But I know the songs, so that was easy to, to start. But it, it was fantastic, you know, and it was like, it is, it is a great experience and I am very happy. And then we bring Alex now. So, <laughs> so we are very, you know, we get, we get a good thing. <laughs> Oh, 
think I already answered that one when you were asking about where the book came from. Uh, the first time we actually met was in 2001. Actually, Sharon was in the next room, and we spoke on that, that same interview. Remember? Yes. It was when 10 New Songs came out, and Leonard had come to London, where I was then living, uh, to do some promotional interviews for his first new album of the new millennium. And let's say the interview just ended up lasting forever, you know, over the space of three days, and it was just absolutely fascinating. So before that, we'd spoken on the phone. You know, quite often journalists don't get in-person interviews, but so this was quite something. And Raphael? <laughs> Since I was 11, I had been listening to uh, Leonard, uh, the songs of Leonard Cohen. Um, it was given to me by uh, a lawyer who had just passed um, the bar at USC and wanted to uh, work in the entertainment s sector. He knew that I wanted to be a drummer. And so uh, my mom was managing the apartment uh, that he and his wife lived in. And he knew, you know, he'd always see me go, hey, kid, how's it going? You know, have you ever heard of Blood, Sweat, and Tears? Have you ever heard of Chicago, how about the new Jimmy Hendrix record? And so he'd bring me up and we'd listen to his song and he, you know, cut me loose. And one day he came to the door and gave me songs of Leonard Cohen on vinyl. He says, here, have this. You wanna be a musician? You gotta check this out. What surprised me is that there's no drums on it. <laughs> Which made me think again that it's, a, it's also about the words. And so, that marriage. Years later, um, in my adult life, I was working with a Norwegian pop band named Aha. Uh, it was on their, don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> They're really nice people. <laughs> um, anyway, um, it was the year I'm Your, I'm Your Man came, was, was released. And um, up and down the bus, they were jumping and singing. First, we take Manhattan and other songs, and they were they were really excited about the record. And during that tour, we played uh, a festival in Oslo, uh, on an island just outside called Kalvoya. It was a three-day festival, <coughs> and Saturday's headliner was Aha. Sunday's headliner was Leonard. Leonard is. I mean, he's big everywhere, but I mean, Norway. You know. <laughs> um, and they thought that was going to be cool. They were going to try and go to the show because it was the last day of the leg of the tour. But what they weren't expecting is that he was going to show up backstage right before we played. And I recognized him. He was dressed almost in the same outfit he wears on the cover of On Your Man. And I saw him. We had minutes to get on stage. And so I just took a deep breath and walked over and said uh, hello, introduced myself, and I said I just wanted to say hello. And I've uh, you know, been an admirer of your music for a long time, but I have one question. What brings you to this concert? For those of you who know AHA. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you do know AHA. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> and standing next to him holding his hand was 13-year-old. Lorca. And um, he said, well, um, I like the music, but my daughter is a really big fan, so I'm bringing her to the show. Um, and I'll wrap this up now real quick. A few months later, I was living in New York City and just making my way back to where I was staying, going along um, Central Park West and walking towards a hotel called the Mayflower which a lot of writers, musicians, people like to stay. It's almost a residency hotel. And, is it gone? It's gone. It's gone. Oh. God, just like Washburn cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was one of those moments where this limousine was pulling up and I was walking and he was walking and it was just like that. And I came up again, I said, I don't know if you remember me. He says, oh yes, it was Norway. I said, yes. <laughs> I said, I just wanted to say hi. And he said, thank you. And that was it. And didn't see him again for about another 20 years. 
Thank you. I just wanted to give a follow-up to the question that you know you'd asked earlier about how he was with his children and everything. He also took a cameo in Miami Vice for his kids. <laughs> uh -huh. You see, I mean, he's done everything for them. Well, you will find those stories and many more in Sylvie's book, which she'll be signing some copies outside, so be sure to pick one up. Also, if you add your name to the email list for Views and Brews, I will send you the recording of this and the highlight video this evening. Um, and before the last piece, I would just like to say how grateful we all are for all of your hard work, all of your dedication, and um, what you do day in and day out to, to bring these songs to life and this life to everyone. Yes, thank so you. thank you. Yeah. over a little bit, but they do have one more piece to perform before we leave, so thank you. This has been fun for me because I've been listening to everybody in the band and discovering their stand-up comedians I never knew. <laughs> Some, a funny moment um, a couple of weeks ago when we played this game on the bus. We had this at the back of the bus. <laughs> there was this um, large table at the back of the bus and these circular sofas. And we decided to play this game where you say one word and then it goes to the next person. Well, I wish we'd recorded that because <laughs> there were some interesting sentences that came out of that. Um, <laughs> Even in your arms I know I'll never get it right even when you bend to give me comfort in the night I've got to have your word on this well, None of it is true And all I've said was just instead of coming back to you
to you Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming out this evening. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Sil Sylvie will be in the back signing books and uh, buy some more drinks. I guess. We'll, we'll do about 25 more tomorrow. Yeah.